Well, we are going to begin a new section in our study this evening. We are moving now into the eighth chapter of the London Baptist Confession. We'll not get too far into this tonight because uh, there's actually in this section 10 different paragraphs, some of them rather lengthy, uh, but we will read through as many of them as we can this evening. Uh, some of these slides, I haven't had a chance to look at them on the overhead yet, how they're going to appear, but because some of them were rather lengthy, I had to play around with the text, so I'm not sure how they're going to display up here. I'm just hoping they'll be big enough that we can, can see them. But we'll, having said that, go ahead and get started, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to see them well enough. The London Baptist Confession of 1689, Chapter 8, Concerning Christ the Mediator. Now, you remember our previous uh, chapter, Chapter 7, dealt with the fact that God has chosen to communicate with his people a covenant. He's entered into a covenant uh, for them and with them, and Christ is now the mediator. So you can see how those sections um, come together. He's the mediator, as Hebrew says, of a better covenant, isn't he? Not better than the one we discussed last week, but better than the covenant under Moses, the Mosaic Covenant, the covenant also referred to as a covenant of works or the law. So we'll go through each of these chapter, each of these paragraphs in this chapter this evening, and then we'll back up as we have in the past and begin to look at the references and deal with the subject of the paragraphs. I'm hoping really in this section to keep my comments very minimal because I, it's very succinct whenever it comes to discussing Christ, and, and we'll, we'll move through and see how it goes. Number one, it pleased God in his eternal purpose to choose and ordain the Lord Jesus, his only begotten Son, according to the covenant made between them both to be the mediator between God and man, the prophet, priest, and king, head and savior of the church, the heir of all things, and judge of the world, unto whom he did from all eternity give a people to be his seed and to be by him in time redeemed, called, justified, sanctified, and glorified. Paragraph number two. That turned out pretty good. Can you still read that? It's a little smaller, but that's the only way I could get it all on one slide without really breaking it up. The Son of God, the second person in the Holy Trinity, being very eternal God, the brightness of the Father's glory, of one substance and equal with him, who made the world, who upholdeth and governeth all things he hath made, did, when the fullness of time was come, take upon him man's nature, with all the essential properties and common infirmities thereof, yet without sin, being conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary, the Holy Spirit coming down upon her, and the power of the Most High overshadowing her, and so was made of a woman of the tribe of Judah, of the seed of Abraham and David, according to the Scriptures, so that two whole, perfect and distinct natures were inseparably joined together in one person, without conversion, composition, or confusion, which person is very God, and very man, yet one Christ, the only mediator between God and man. 
And obviously that section, and we'll get into that a little bit when we come to that, is dealing with that hypostatic union of Christ, the fact that he is both God and man, yet one person. Paragraph number three, the Lord Jesus, in his human nature, thus united to the divine in the person of the Son, was sanctified and anointed with the Holy Spirit above measure having in him all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, in whom it pleased the Father that all fullness should dwell to the end, that being holy, harmless, undefiled, and full of grace and truth, he might be thoroughly furnished to execute the office of mediator and surety, which office he took not upon himself, but was thereunto called by his Father, who also put all power and judgment in his hand and gave him commandment to execute the same. This office the Lord Jesus did most willingly undertake, paragraph number four, which that he might discharge he was made under the law and did perfectly fulfill it, and underwent the punishment due to us, which we should have borne and suffered, being made sin and a curse for us, enduring most grievous sorrows in his soul and most painful sufferings in his body, was crucified and died, and remained in the state of the dead, yet saw no corruption. On the third day he arose from the dead with the same body in which he suffered, with which he also ascended into heaven, and there sitteth at the right hand of his Father, making intercession, and shall return to judge men and angels at the end of the world. Do what? Yeah, that's number four. Um, the one before this was three. Yeah. That one made it in there, yes. Or I think it did. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, It's that's all in there. Yeah, well, it's, some of those were long, and I had to squeeze them down, so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of funny how you can do this thing because you actually enlarge the font, but it as you enlarge it because it's framed in, it condenses it. So you have to play with it back and forth. It's, it's a weird software issue. That's why I wasn't sure how it was going to turn out since it you can almost see the bottom numbers look a little bigger. Uh, okay. Number Paragraph number five. This was a short one. <laughs> the Lord Jesus by his perfect obedience and sacrifice of himself, which he through the eternal spirit once offered up unto God, hath fully satisfied the justice of God, procured reconciliation, and purchased an everlasting inheritance in the kingdom of heaven for all those whom the Father hath given unto him. Paragraph number six. Although the price of redemption was not actually paid by Christ till after his incarnation, yet the virtue, efficacy, and benefit thereof were communicated to the elect in all ages, successively from the beginning of the world, in and by those promises, types, and sacrifices, wherein he was revealed and signified to be the seed which should bruise the serpent's head, and the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, being the same yesterday and today and forever. Paragraph number seven. Christ, in the work of mediation, acteth according to both natures, by each nature doing that which is proper to itself, yet by reason of the unity of the person, that which is proper to one nature, is sometimes in Scripture attributed to the person denominated by the other nature. 
and we'll look at that obviously more in detail when we come to it. Paragraph number eight. To all those for whom Christ hath obtained eternal redemption, he doth certainly and effectually apply and communicate the same, making intercession for them, uniting them to himself by his Spirit, revealing unto them in and by his word the mystery of salvation, persuading them to believe and obey, governing their hearts by his word and Spirit, and overcoming all their enemies by his almighty power and wisdom in such manner and ways as are most consonant to his wonderful and unsearchable dispensation, and all of free and absolute grace without any condition foreseen in them to procure it. Paragraph number 9. This office of mediator between God and man is proper only to Christ, who is the prophet, priest, and king of the church of God, and may not be either in whole or any part thereof transferred from him to any other. Paragraph number 10 and the last slide. This number and order of offices is necessary. For in respect of our ignorance, we stand in need of his prophetical office, and in respect of our alienation from God and imperfection of the best of our services, we need his priestly office to reconcile us and present us acceptable unto God. And in respect to our averseness and utter inability to return to God, and for our rescue and security from our spiritual adversaries, we need his kingly office to convince, subdue, draw, uphold, deliver, and preserve us to his heavenly kingdom. You know, in this article, on this last slide, one of the things that they have been consistent to do, and this is through all of this, is they they are in very succinct form conveying clearly these truths and how they all interrelate to one another so that we should recognize and we all do and are aware of that fact that if you tweak one thing in scripture whether it has to do with Jesus the atonement or anything you're you're tweaking with God's perfect plan. And you know what happens when you mess with something that's already perfect and you're imperfect, right? It's like if it's not broke, don't what? Fix it. Because it is not broke. And Scripture is true. God is true. His plan is true. We don't need to tweak it. Just take what He says and believe it. Well, let's go back to the first slide this evening. Do that by stopping, and then we'll scroll down here. We will take a look at multiple verses this evening in this first one. It pleased God in, the, in His eternal purpose to choose and ordain the Lord Jesus his only begotten Son, according to the covenant made between them both, A, to be the mediator between God and man. The, uh, between God and man. Let's see. I want to look at, well, let's just take a look at the text here before us. The first one is Isaiah, as you can see, chapter 42, verse 1. Isaiah 42, 1. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. 
Why do you, what is one of the reasons you think that they chose that verse? And I just kind of hinted to you why. Notice it pleased God in His eternal purpose to choose and ordain the Lord Jesus, His only begotten Son, according to the covenant made between them both, to be the mediator. Notice in that first verse, Jesus is chosen of God, isn't He? My chosen one, in whom my soul delights, right? You remember what God said about Christ at his baptism? He was coming up out of the water, and John witnessed the dove descending on him, right? And, and he heard a voice out of heaven. They all did. And you remember what the voice said? This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, right? You know, that's a blessing to us. We are in him in whom God is well pleased. Is there any other better place? There isn't. We're in Him with whom God is well pleased. Also on the Mount of Transfiguration, you remember the same voice was heard by Peter, James, and John. Except there was an added phrase to it. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And then the Father said, Hear, the King James Version, ye him. God still pleased with his Son. Praise the Lord, and he is today. We'll see that Matthew actually, well, let's take a look over there right now. Matthew chapter 12 with me to show and demonstrate that this is indeed fulfilled. These words in Isaiah 42, verse 1 fulfilled in Jesus Christ, Matthew chapter 12. In Matthew 12, jump down with me to verse... Let's back up to verse 15. But Jesus, Matthew 12, 15, But Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Many followed him, and he healed them all, and warned them not to tell who he was. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. And here the Holy Spirit is referring to Isaiah 42.1. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved whom my soul is well ple in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. So we clearly see a fulfillment of Isaiah 42, 1, in Jesus Christ. He's the chosen one. We'll look at some other verses later that aren't in the, the document, also that refer to the election or the fact that Christ is the elect of God. He's chosen by God. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, and down there to verse 19. But with, First Peter 1, 19, But with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world but appeared in these last times for the sake of you. So, um, uh, again, clearly, and we, we see that he was foreknown, but he appeared in the last times for us. The next reference is to Acts chapter 3, verse 22. Acts chapter 3 and verse 22. Referring to the fact that Christ is indeed the prophet. Acts chapter 3 and 22. And if you turn to Acts 3 and 22, you're turning to Peter's second message. 
Acts 2 is his first recorded one. His second after the Pentecost is here in Acts 3. Verse 22. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. Now, that's a reference. Peter's actually referencing Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15. That's where Moses made that prophecy. And as you already are aware, and I just referred to it a moment ago from Matthew chapter 17, what did God say? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Right? Listen to him. And now notice what Peter says here again in this text in Acts 3 and 22. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. Christ is the prophet. You remember they asked John the Baptist that question, didn't they? Are you the, the prophet? They thought that John the Baptist was the prophet that Moses was or had prophesied of. And John clearly was not the prophet. He was not Christ, and he denied that. But Christ indeed is the prophet. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5, with regard to Christ being the priest. Hebrews 5 verse 5. Now, you remember we just read a moment ago the importance of these, these titles, right? Prophet, priest, and king, and positions that he holds. And uh, that's at the end of this document, but they've established early on that he is prophet, priest, and king. Hebrews chapter 5, and down to verse 5 with me. So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Just as he says also in another passage, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And you'll remember that the Melchizedek priesthood was superior to the Aaronic priesthood, which the Aaronic priesthood was in place during the Mosaic Covenant, wasn't it? But Christ's priesthood is superior because he is a priest forever. Were the Aaronic priests priests forever? They died, didn't they? When they died, another guy came up and um, he couldn't, his priesthood wouldn't go on because he died. Well, Christ is a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So, prophet, priest, and how about king? Let's take a look to... Uh, and, and actually, let's go over to Acts 17, 31. Is another reference they give here. Let's take a look at that. Acts 17 and 31. And this, obviously, um, referring to the judgment, Acts 17... 31, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Isaiah 53.10, actually, uh, the idea of Acts 17.31 re refers to his kingship in that he is going to judge the dead by him. Actually, I've skipped through some of these, didn't I? Yes, I did. We'll back up to Psalm chapter 2. Also referring to his kingship, Psalm 2. The kings of the earth shall take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords. 
uh, Psalm 2. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm at the wrong verse. I was reading 2. It's at 6. But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Luke chapter 1, verse 33. Luke one thirty three, And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. He's a king with a kingdom. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2. In these last days he has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the world. We read Acts 17.31. So he is prophet, he is priest, and he is king. He is head and savior of the church for the heir of all things and judge of the world, unto whom he did from all eternity give a people to his seed, to be his seed, and to be by him in time redeemed, called, justified, sanctified, and glorified. Isaiah 53 and verse 10. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. He will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. He will see, literally, his seed. Take a look at John 17, verse 6. Uh, do what? Go ahead and finish it out for us. 53 and 10. Mm -hmm. Yes, it will. I was focusing on, on the this aspect where, take a look back there uh, at the reference here. He will give a people to his seat to be his seed. And Isaiah 53.10, that part of it is referring that his offspring to his seed. This is why they quoted that particular text. But yes, the entire verse reads as it goes on, uh, the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Um, yeah. Take a look back to John with me, chapter 17. And verse 6, John 17 and 6. I have manifested your name to the men whom, and notice the phrase, what? You gave me. Out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. And again, fulfilling that part of the text that's here um, that God has given him a people. And here clearly in Christ's prayer, he's acknowledging that the Father has given a people uh, to the Son. And as the text goes on, it says of those individuals that he, Christ, in time redeemed, 
called, justified, sanctified, and glorified. All right. To be by him in time. So all of those that God has given to Christ, the document is conveying that he will redeem them, call them, justify them, sanctify, and glorify. That's right. That's it. Well, actually, in the context of that, he does pray for all of them. If you jump down to verse 20, he says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who believe in me through their word. But we're going to look at some other verses here in just a moment to demonstrate that that seed extends even beyond these individuals, as verse 20 conveys clearly there. Um, go with me to Romans chapter 8, verse 30. Referring, obviously, to what will be done to those given to the Son by the Father in time. These whom he predestined, Romans 8.30, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. I've given you the references already for prophet, priest, and king. We're going to look at a couple others there, but also let's take a moment and mention a couple other references. Christ is the elected one of God. He is indeed chosen by God. Luke chapter 23 with me. These are verses not necessarily referenced in this document at this point. Luke 23 35. Notice what the people said here. The people stood by looking on him, or stood by looking on, and even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If this is the Christ of God, his, what? Chosen one. Even the people acknowledged that it had been taught that Christ was the chosen one, didn't they? And now they're using that to ridicule him, aren't they? They could not get their mind around what fact right here, right now. What could they not see? They couldn't see his divinity. What else? What, I could ask it this way, what was preventing them from seeing the fact that Christ was. They are, they're confessing, they, they heard at least that he was the chosen one, but what was happening to keep them from seeing and realizing that he was indeed the chosen one? Okay, but what practical thing right here happening? He was dying. That's right. He was hanging on the cross. And they couldn't get their mind around that truth because they had only believed a half of a truth out of the Old Testament. The chosen one, the anointed one, he's going to come in glory and he's going to deliver Israel. And how can that be if he's hanging, dying on the cross? Do you see that there? That's right, from Deuteronomy, and from the New Testament, cursed. Not chosen by God, but cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. I mean, obviously, they had no faith, did they? Because in faith, they could see that. And we could even argue that it's possible for Christians, while they may have the faith, they may not, if they are focused on something else, may not see, even by faith, until they look with faith on God's truth, all that God has said. Let's see, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, one more verse with reference to him being the elect. 1 Peter 2 and 4, that God chose him. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 4. 
and coming unto him as to a living stone, Peter referring to Christ, which has been rejected by men, by men but is choice or elect and precious in the sight of God. Peter confirming again that Christ is God's elected one, the one God has chose, the one in whom God is well pleased. Obviously, as Ephesians 1 brings out, chapter 1, verse 4, we are chosen in him. We saw that Acts chapter 3, verse 22, referred specifically to Christ and that he is indeed the prophet that Moses spoke of in Deuteronomy 18.15. He is also the priest. Take a look in Revelation chapter 1 with me. Verse 12 through 16. This is an interesting text because you'll remember that the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 8 said this is the sum of what we've been saying that we have a high priest who's entered into the heavens, right? He referred to Christ clearly as the high priest, a great high priest. And whenever John, sometime later after the book of Hebrews was written, saw Christ while John was on the Isle of Patmos, he saw Christ clothed in priestly garments. Revelation chapter 1, verse 12. He says, I turned, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the middle of the lampstands I saw one, like a son of man, clothed in a robe reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. And his head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet were like burnished bronze when he had been, uh, when it had been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many thunders. goes on talking about in his right hand what he was holding, the seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp sword. But whenever you um, back up to verse 13, those are depictions of priestly garments that John saw Christ clothed in. He saw him as priest. Also, uh, look at chapter... Um, or chapter 17 of Revelation, he was also king. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 14, and we're going to take this in conjunction with Revelation 17, or Revelation 19.6. Revelation 17.14, These will wage war against the Lamb. And the Lamb will overcome them, because He is Lord of lords and, what? King of kings, isn't He? And clearly we're talking about Christ here, aren't we? He's the Lamb, isn't He? That's a distinct identification uh, with Christ. He's God's Lamb. We saw that back over in Revelation early on, whenever John saw Him as a Lamb having been slain, right? And here the Lamb is the King of Kings. So Christ is King. Jump over a couple chapters to chapter 19. And there, um, Revelation 19. And down to... Bear with me just a second. I'll get to it. 16. Referring to the second coming of Christ. He's seeing him come from heaven, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's prophet, he's priest, and he's king. And finally, some other references dealing with the fact, as this last paragraph says in the document here, before it's the last few lines of it, there is a people that have been given to him. That becomes very clear in John chapter 6, as we went through these not too long ago, John 6 verse 37, referring specifically to people, he says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, 
And the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. So all that the Father gives, right? The Father has given, and we'll see these are the sheep, and the sheep being people here in a moment. Verse 39 of the same chapter, This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me. So again, he's given people to Christ. I will lose nothing, or I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. And um, go with me to chapter 10 of John, verse 26. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep. Now, those obviously, as we will see in a moment, are sheep who have not been given to him. They are sheep, in all probability, but they're not of his. He says, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And then notice verse 29. My Father who has, what? Given them to me. Is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand, or out of the Father's hand. So, His sheep come to Him. His sheep are those that the Father has given to Him. Does that make sense? So we can say, anyone that comes to Jesus Christ, and comes obviously by faith, they are the ones that God has given to him, right? They are his sheep. And that was something that God ordained before the foundation of the world. So from this paragraph, we're seeing that Christ is God's chosen one. And he is the mediator of this covenant that God has with his people. And that Christ is the prophet, he's the priest, he's the king. And we're going to see as we move through this document the importance of those three aspects of his ministry. And he has come for the people that God has given to him. So that they can be, by him, called, justified, sanctified, and glorified, and redeemed. Right? Any comments or questions? Then we will pick up with our second paragraph next Wednesday evening. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God in heaven, we do thank you for Jesus, that he is prophet, priest, and king, that he is God that he is man, that he perfectly represents you to us. And Father in heaven, we thank you that we are perfectly represented in him. Thank you. Give us wisdom, give us discernment concerning these things. Help us to see the gravity of them, how important they are, and how important it is that we we genuinely and rightly define Christ, and not as we would in our own flesh want to define him, but as you have defined him. In Jesus' name, amen.